So, welcome back. Did you get a snack or has it been a day? I don't know how long I've been waiting here. It's kind of awkward. In any case, welcome back to Ethics and Leadership. So in the last uh, lecture, the first part of this lecture, I guess you can look at it either way, we started talking about Plato and Plato's view of justice and the structure of the Republic. We came to realize that there are, for Plato, three different classes, three different unequal classes that are in some ways naturally unequal with each other. Those guardians who are the highest level of society focused on knowledge driven by their reason. The auxiliaries who are focused on honor driven by their thumos, their spirit. And the producers, those who are focused on material goods and are driven by their appetites. Okay, now, right now, we're gonna go on and we're gonna say how this parallels uh, the image that Plato has of the self. We remember back to the dialogue with Thrasymachus, where Plato says, okay, let's look at the robber band. And it seems that the robber band would fall apart if it had no justice. And then he says, well, what about the individual? Isn't the same the case in the individual? Now, at that point, he's foreshadowing what he's going to do with the individual in relation to the state. Because he's just laid out a picture of the state that has three different parts, right? Well, if the state has three different parts, we could also expect individuals to have three different parts within them. Here, I've got an incredibly awkward picture that kind of makes this point. So we can see these three different thoughts. This is how Plato uh, posits that there are the three different parts of the human being. He says, you know, sometimes you can argue with yourself. Sometimes one part of you wants to do something, but another part of you doesn't want to do it. And you actually have an internal struggle between those parts of yourself to figure out. So if you put a whole pizza in front of me, right? There's part of me that is going to want to dive in and eat that whole pizza. But then there's another part of me that's going to say, ah, over the long term, is that kind of the most reasonable thing to do? And oh my goodness, you'll get heartburn, you'll have all of these problems, and hey, let's not do that. And so I could have a fight between these two parts of myself. And so he suggests that there are three different things within you that are, that are fighting it out. Now, we've actually already seen those three different things, but I'm going to develop them a little bit further. So you can imagine that, on the one hand, this person up there is thinking, I must satisfy my basic instincts, food, drink, reproduction, shelter, sleep. Now, what is it in you that is concerned about these? Well, it's your appetites. Your Appetites, and there's not just one of them, they're plural. So in fact, your appetites can get in fights with each other. It might be that you feel like sleeping and you feel like eating, and you've got to figure out which one of those appetites you're going to follow, right? Especially if you're out of control, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But your, your, your appetites are like the demos. They're like the people. They're like the producers. So there's a whole bunch of them. And if left to themselves, they would cause a lot of trouble. Next, we look above his head and it says, I must be careful when I cross the road and ensure I retain my sense of individualism. Well, uh, this is, I don't know that those are the best, the best lines to get to it, but, but in any case, this is his spirit, his thumos, which is concerned, it's his bravery. So it knows how afraid he should be going out into the road. It's concerned with developing himself as an individual, the honor of the self, right? Um, whether you're liked by other people, um, how you're concerned about what other people think of you. We could go back to the Ring of Gyges. It's really interesting. The Ring of Gyges asks you the question, how much do you act good because you are good, and how much do you act good because you want to look good to others? That desire to look good to others, that's your thumos, your spirit. And that, as we've seen, is, is tied to this, this spiritedness, this concern for bravery and honor. Then, on the other hand, I must seek to 
I must seek understanding and above all search for the truth. Well, here is your reason. You want to know the truth. You want to know the truth about goodness. So, for instance, when I was having that fight over my pizza, my desires, my appetites were going crazy. They were trying to make me eat the pizza. But my reason said, you know what? I know that eating this whole pizza is not good for you. So though my appetite might want the pizza, my knowledge, my knowledge of the order of myself tells me oh, that's not really the best thing for you. And my knowledge of what's good, my knowledge of that order, is given to me by reason. And my reason is what pursues that knowledge. Now, knowing what you do about Plato, we can say a little bit more about how the just person is then ordered. Oh, before we do that, I, I wanted to, I got highlights, different See reason, spirit, appetites? You see, you see the pizza? You see the pizza behind me? Those are all, those are my examples. So that, so the, you can choose your, if you're a girl or a guy, which, which appetites you want to follow. And there's, there's reason, just right. I hope I pointed at that right. And then there's, and then there's, uh, there's your spiritedness there over in the corner. Okay, those are more examples. Okay, so we can say something about how you are supposed to be ordered or how the just person would be ordered. The just person is the person whose reason is in charge of them. Whose reason, whose knowledge of the good, orders everything else inside themselves. Now, your reason might use your spiritedness, your thumos, in order to control your appetites, right? So you can think sometimes, maybe it's better if you decide, uh, try this for example, if I was to go on a diet, I might announce it to other people that I'm going on a diet because I know that by announcing it to them, I've put my honor at stake if I go back on the diet. Right? So my reason might use my spiritedness, my concern for honor, in order to control my appetites. Because my appetites are the things that are most likely to get out of control. So I really need to, this is a top-down picture. The reason needs to give orders to the, the thumos, the spirit, and the spirit needs to keep control of the appetites and how the appetites function. Ideally, in a really just person, even the, the thumos, the spirit, wouldn't need to do that much because the reason would be so powerful in controlling the appetites. But as we sit, our appetites are incredibly powerful in us, at least in most of us, right? So it will only be for the most just of people that they are able to control themselves and really put their reason in charge of everything else. The further you fall away from this ideal, the further you fall away from true justice, from truly being a just person, according to Plato. Now, if you know that this is how you're supposed to be, then you should in fact snap to it. Because Plato believes that if you know what's truly good for you, you will do what's truly good for you, right? Put that knowledge, put your reason in charge. If you know that the reason should be in charge, you will in fact have your reason in charge. But all of us doubt that, I guess. This is a little bit of our, our failing, that we think that, we believe that, if we give our appetites a little bit of room, then we'll actually be better off. And this confuses us. For a moment when the pizza's in front of me, I trick myself into thinking that, in fact, what is best for me is to eat the entire pizza. I lose my mind for a moment. Or when I'm in front of, say, the girl or guy that I like, I might go a little bit crazy because I'm concerned about honor. I'm concerned about getting the approval of that person. 
And so I might lose control and, and, and forget what's actually good for me if I was in fact calm and rational. The rational person, the reasonable person, is the just person, according to Plato. And this is how we should run our lives. To use uh, the metaphor that he does, he says that it's like a charioteer that's driving two horses. So in this metaphor, reason is the charioteer, and reason is trying to drive the two horses and control where they go, right? And you can see in this picture, because it's pictured on Plato's metaphor, that one horse is more focused than the other. The other is kind of jumping up and causing trouble as it goes. Well, Plato says this is like the reason's control over the spirit and the reason's control over the appetites. Because while the spirit can be led more easily, the appetites are always trying to get off, always trying to run away. And so he says, yeah, the reason must pull on the reins sometime, even so much that the bit in the horse's mouth draws blood out the side in order to control those appetites and pull them back down so that the reason is absolutely in control of the self. Um, another metaphor that he, that he gives is a story of a person who comes back and there's been, there's been a, a, a murder. And as the person passes, they don't want to look at what's happened. They don't want to look at the bodies. They know that there's no advantage to this, that it's, that it's puerile to look at the bodies. And yet, they're drawn to look at them. And this person finally gives in and he looks at the bodies and he says, Fine eyes, get your fill. Well, this is, this is again, I mean, you could think about it like being on the highway. And when there's an accident off to the side, people stop and they want to look and they slow down their cars. Even though this will make them late for where they're going, even though it in interferes with other cars, it causes everything to get off track. Plato would say, that's because your appetites are taking over and you're losing the control of your reason over you. All right. So at this point, we can see the parallels between the state and the individual. In the state, the guardians should be in charge. They are the rulers. They are driven by reason, and they pursue knowledge and apply that knowledge. In yourself, the reason should be in charge, because it is what pursues knowledge, gains knowledge about the order that you should be ordered by, and applies that to yourself. Then there's, in the city, the auxiliaries, who are driven by their thumos, who are most interested in honor, and are in charge of enforcing on the productive class, the producers, um, what they should do, their own moderation. In yourself, the spirit, your thumos, should in fact, uh, when properly led, um, use itself only to enforce upon the the passions, the appetites, what they should do. And then the basest part of yourself, those crazy appetites, those out-of-control appetites that can't really be trained, that can't really be negotiated with, but can only be put down, put into their place. Now, this doesn't mean they don't have any role. I mean, the just person will, in fact, eat but will only eat when it's appropriate. The just person won't, as Thrasymachus said, go beyond everyone else, gaining always more wealth and more power, but will tame those appetites for those things and will only want appropriate amounts of everything. So the productive class and the appetites are their parallel that each one of these is a little bit out of control and needs to be put down, controlled by the rest of the society so that it doesn't get out of control and ruin everything, lead to chaos and anarchy. And at this point, we can say something about what an unjust self looks like. So just as with the state, there are different forms of unjust selves and, again, they parallel. And maybe you can think about people who fit these different models. 
So, unjust people, you might have a timocratic person. Now, the timocratic person would, of course, be someone who is driven by their own thumos, or spirit. So they would be concerned, above all else, with honor, with their own pride. Um, today, people often talk about what's toxic masculinity, right? Um, this kind of person who is so concerned about themselves and their own honor that they throw everything else away. Um, I don't know if anyone uh, watched Breaking Bad, which was uh, uh, a show that was on HBO, um, that had a central character that for all the life of him could never accept help from other people and always created for himself problem after problem as he would not violate his own pride in order to get other people to help him out. Then... There's the possibility of the oligarchic self. Well, the oligarchic self is driven by the appetites, but not just any appetites. The oligarchic self figures that all appetites can best be served by gaining money. And so this person pursues money above all else, thinking that if they just can get enough money, they will eventually find happiness that happiness comes through mastery of markets and business, and that eventually if they could just get enough money, they would be happy to finish. But of course, as soon as you've, you've started down this road, when do you have enough money? And is money valuable in itself? Well, Plato would say no, right? I mean, money is valuable for the things it can get you. But you only ever have appropriate things if you have them in the proper amount, if you recognize how they're supposed to be balanced with each other in a good life. So the oligarchic, the oligarchic personality will, in fact, not end up being a happy person at all. They might think that the good life ends with you having the most, but in the end, everything you have disappears. Then we could go to the democratic person. And at this point, Plato would imagine a person who is simply indecisive, unable to come up with plans for their own life because they drift around between their different desires. They're unable to control. Right now I want a pizza. Right now I want sex. Right now I want whatever else it is. They keep moving back and forth. They can't decide whether to sleep all day, whether to go to work in order to get money, what, what it is that they want to do with their life. And they're unable to put everything together into one plan. They have no knowledge of the overall good. They have no plan for themselves. And so they're unable to ever achieve anything as a whole person. Now, the bottom level here would be the tyrannical personality. The tyrannical personality is one in which one of these desires, one of these appetites, takes over all the rest. And everything becomes oriented towards a desire, not the desire for knowledge, however, not even the desire for honor, which would have been better, but a desire for some particular material or physical good. This becomes the overriding desire which orders everything else in the self towards it. Now, in order to get a picture here, we could think about addiction. A person who is addicted to a particular drug or a particular person or relationship, whatever it is that they're addicted to, that that becomes the only thing in their lives worthy of their concern. So that everything that they do is focused on getting another hit, getting another belt of what that is that they are addicted to. The life of a junkie is the life of the tyrannical personality. And that person, says Plato, is never really able to be happy because they spend their entire lives wanting again and again and again after that transient good that they can never nail down. And the reason that their life is so unfulfilling 
is because they don't know what to aim for. They don't know that they should, in fact, be focused on knowledge, on the form of the good, and on order of the self. They've lost that. Okay. So at this point, Plato's developed a, a kind of response to Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus had said that the pure injustice will, in fact, lead to happiness, where pure justice will lead to unhappiness. Plato has responded by saying, I've looked at these different forms of injustice, and to the tyrannical person seems to be the most unjust, and that person is the least happy. So, has Plato succeeded? In some ways, his goal here is actually to convince the reader, to convince the person that's been going through, that the just life is, in fact, the best. And he thinks if he has convinced you, if he's given you this knowledge, then that should actually change you. Because knowing the good, you will do what's good. So if you know that the just life is, in fact, the happiest life, then you wouldn't want to use the Ring of Gaijus you would be the person who would be perfectly fine throwing it away because you will no longer be tempted by these apparent goods. You'd be able to control yourself and only want to do and want what's best for yourself, which is to be the ordered, calm, rational individual. Okay, so at this point I want to go over some of those themes that I highlighted in the first lecture and say something about how Plato comes down in relation to the themes of the class. This will be useful because we'll be able to use this to compare Plato to later philosophers as we go through. So what does Plato say about human nature? Well, are humans good or bad? Uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some people are capable of being just and all are capable of participating in the just society if properly formed. So there's no necessity that stops human beings from being just. There's nothing intrinsic to human beings or necessary about being a human being that stops you from being just. You are not intrinsically evil. However, it's got to be said that on Plato's system, it does seem that at least some people can never get to the fullness of justice that he imagines, because really it's only those guardians, only the kind of upper class, top class of society that would be able to realize the fullness of justice. Now, it's, un it's unclear exactly how much he wants to, to draw this distinction. Because when he's talking about the state, he emphasizes this natural inequality in society. But when he's talking about individuals, and he's talking about justice internal to individuals, he does treat it like something that perhaps everyone could achieve. So there's a tension in Plato's thought about exactly where we should lay this down. Are people always inherently unequal, and where should we set the limits for them? Um, if we're talking about politics, he seems to say, yeah, some people are unable to achieve that, and so their capacities should be lined up with other activities in the society. But when talking about individuals, he seems to want to push everyone to be as just as possible, at least. Social or individual? Well, here it seems that societies shape individuals, and moral individuals contribute to the common good. So individuals come from the society, and individuals ought to be expected to contribute to the society. He doesn't imagine individuals apart from the society. Now, there is a slight exception to this, which is the philosopher who, who gains access to the form of the good might realize something about their own society that is unjust, and they shouldn't be limited by the society in trying to bring about reform or change to the society. So he does have a mechanism for people to transcend their society at least somewhat in bringing about changes to the society. And this is a bit in tension with his general picture of the common good where everyone contributes to the common good 
as it ought to exist. But realize that that picture of the common good is linked to his picture of the perfectly just society. And as we've seen, this society probably doesn't exist ever in the real world. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. People and property. Though Plato recognizes that some people are motivated by material goods, he thinks that truly just people should not be motivated by material goods, at least not primarily motivated by material goods. Truly just people will be motivated by the form of the good. They will partake in material goods, they'll eat, uh, they'll sleep, and they'll do all of these things in as much as it helps them to continue investigating and knowing the form of the good and applying the form of the good in their own society as much as possible. But they are not primarily motivated by that. Material goods become at best a means for them. And even there, Plato thought that perhaps we should limit ownership amongst the rulers of society so that they wouldn't turn to greed and they wouldn't turn to ambition and wouldn't allow that to become confusing for them. Equality or inequality? Well, again, I've said that in treating the individual, Plato does emphasize that it seems like it's possible for anyone to become more just. But in his political thinking, it's also pretty clear that he doesn't expect everyone to get to a, to a position of justice. He expects that different people have different capacities. And this means that we should treat them differently. Um, every person should do their own role, should do what they're supposed to do. In an ancient form of justice, we could say, to each what each is due. And the rulers, the guardians, are due obedience. The auxiliaries are due some honor if they fulfill their role. The producers are due some material goods if they produce for the whole rest of the society. So everyone should get what they're due, which has to do with their own capacities and what motivates them. Human beings are naturally unequal, according to Plato. The shape of government. Well, Plato has, a, in his ideal state, a strict hierarchy of society. With the philosopher king or philosopher kings, philosopher queen or philosopher queens in charge. He does not want a democracy. He does not want an oligarchy. He does not want a tyranny. He wants this perfectly just society. Now, he does seem to recognize that we don't have that perfect society, and so exactly what we're supposed to do in the real world, well, we have to try and figure that out for ourselves. But in his ideal, he would have a strictly hierarchical society with some people in charge giving everyone else their roles in society. Now, this is not a form of authoritarianism or dictatorship as we would usually think about it, however. Because Plato believes that the rulers in his hierarchy will know what is good and what makes for the happiness of everyone else in society. So he has built into his system the idea that they will in fact give everyone the role that fulfills their deepest needs and makes them the most happy. Now that doesn't match with our pictures of a dictatorship or authoritarianism or the picture of the tyrant that he develops. So it doesn't exactly fit with that, although in some ways it is a very strict hierarchy and far more strict than anyone uh, in modernity would usually put forward as a theory of what the good state would look like. The purpose of government. Well, the purpose of government ought to be to order the society towards the common good and shape individuals for participation in that common good. Everyone's supposed to be contributing to society. Society is meant to develop the capabilities of people so that they can contribute to the society. And people are supposed to be shaped for that participation. Remember that he said the noble lie can be told to the people so that they buy into the common good and they hand themselves over, their services over to the society. The society itself is, in many respects, the highest good in this system. Even those rulers, even the guardians, 
take time out from their pursuit of knowledge to serve the society by ordering everyone else. What is it in Plato's system that authorizes leadership? Well, it's not a process. It's not that the leader has been elected, selected by the most people. It's not that the leader is uh, in an order of, of uh, monarchy. It, Plato mentions that, as a matter of fact, guardians might have children that are auxiliaries, or it might be that auxiliaries have children that are best suited to be guardians. There's no necessity that your children will function the same as you do. And the guardians will have to recognize that and be continually sorting people into their different classes. So he doesn't imagine that this is a hereditary society that uh, immediately gives to the children the same roles that their parents had. So in some sense, it's not a society that is fixed by any process. But the leader should be authorized by their particular characteristics. The leader is marked by knowledge, gained through painful development. The leader is not motivated by honor or wealth and does not particularly want to lead, but will do so as a matter of service to the other. They lead in service to the weaker and to the other. So this is Plato's ideal republic. This is Plato's ideal picture. Now, in the forum, I want you to tell me, do you think this is a, a good way of going about things? I suggested at the beginning, the first part of this lecture, that you might think of a society that would be perfect that's quite different. And I want you to, in your comments, give Plato uh, his, his own due. Um, he does have a system that, I've, as I've said, is not really authoritarian, it's not really dictatorial, although we might have serious questions about it. And I'll raise a couple of those right now so that they can be starting points for your thought as you go on to critique Plato. So one problem is a problem that Plato himself raises for Thrasymachus in the dialogue, the argument from ignorance. When Thrasymachus suggests that justice is the interest of the most powerful, Plato comes along and he says, or he has Socrates say, look, um, won't the most powerful sometimes make errors in making their laws so that they make laws that are not in their own interest? Well, we might want to come back to Socrates and say, okay, but what happens if the guardians make mistakes? Now, he himself has kind of posited that these guardians will have pure knowledge. And he seems to assume that this kind of pure knowledge exists. As if the knowledge of, say, the structure of a molecule could be the same as the knowledge of the structure of a society. So that knowing the structure of the molecule, you can tell what it's supposed to look like, just like knowing the structure of a society, you can assign people to their proper places. But it's not clear that society ever works that way. Are we really after this kind of abstract knowledge? Is that what we want out of our leaders? Or would that kind of knowledge be too abstract to be useful in actually ordering a society? Do we want a more practical kind of knowledge? And can that practical kind of knowledge be complete so that you would never make an error? Most people, starting off with Aristotle, Plato's own student, were somewhat unconvinced by Plato on this point, and don't believe that you could actually have leaders that have this kind of absolute knowledge. And if you don't have leaders that have that kind of absolute knowledge, it's not clear that we should hand anybody the kind of power that Plato wants to hand to the leaders that he has, because that is exactly when a government will move from being a good government to a tyranny very quickly. Related to this is the question of the emphasis on order. So Plato assumes that a just society will consist in a kind of stable order of people in relation to each other. Does this say enough about how societies are really dynamic and how individuals are dynamic? Should we give individuals one particular role and have them stuck into that role and say, that will be your role for your life? 
would that ever make for a fulfilling life? If this was the one role you got to participate in. We could even say this of the ruling class, those who focus on knowledge. Now, I don't want to diminish the idea that people are, are interested in knowledge or that knowledge could be, in fact, a, a great value that you would pursue. I don't know if you've ever had a kind of eureka moment or sometime when something just snapped to in your head that you came to realize, oh, that's how that fits together, right? That, that's a, that can be a great experience. And hopefully, as you're going through your education, you have some of those experiences where everything kind of snaps together and it all makes sense. And I, I can imagine that that would be a great value to proceed, to proceed after, to, to kind of think that this will be, in fact, the continuous experience of my life as I go from greater to greater knowledge, as, and then as I rest in true knowledge, that I can always have that experience of knowing how everything goes together. But would that all by itself be sufficient for a fulfilled life? Just feeling that experience? Many people have wondered whether Plato's focus on order has insufficiently taken into account how dynamic people are and how dynamic society is. So to question whether we should actually have, whether the most just society, the most fulfilling society, would in fact have one role for people, or whether it wouldn't have lots of roles for people, whether it wouldn't have them in dynamic places. Now this is applicable even in business today, as you think about people who work at Walmart, right? In general, Walmart is, in some ways, structured on a very basic order. Everybody has particular jobs that are theirs, and they're supposed to do them continuously. But the question is, is that really fulfilling over the long haul, or can you only do that for a short period of time? Is this something that will make for a fulfilling life over time? Or should the leaders lead in a different direction? Okay. Um... There's a lack of appreciation in Plato, many think, for appetites. Plato doesn't give much to how much our appetites do drive us and perhaps how much they should, how much input they should have into shaping our lives. So Plato seems to suggest that indulging in your appetites is never a good thing to do, right? But this might underestimate, again, in the dynamic life of an individual, how much sometimes, you know what, we do indulge. This happens. And maybe it's okay from time to time to participate in these things. As a matter of fact, maybe our appetites tell us something about what's good for us. It's not just that we eat because we have knowledge that eating will, in fact, continue our lives and allow us to pursue knowledge. We eat in part because... We enjoy eating, and we make better foods because of it. Is this a problem? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think that maybe culinary arts, maybe developing better foods, maybe developing better tastes, maybe that's a, an important part of human life. And Plato's picture seems to miss that. Finally, inevitably in modernity, I think most people are going to challenge Plato's acceptance of inequality. Now, I want to I want to make a, a distinction here because I think Plato, in many ways, has a point in trying to challenge what we would think of as the the immediate equality of individuals that we think of human beings as made equal. Too often today, I think modern thinkers ignore the fact that human beings are not created equal, are not capable of the same things, and then they structure a society as if everyone is already equal to each other. So we assume that everybody has the same capabilities, and we assume that if, if somebody is unable to do something, it's simply because they didn't want to use their capabilities, right? Well, th that's not the case, and Plato is, seems to me, is right here, that there are people with different abilities and disabilities. And if we're concerned with equality, which Plato was not, it seems to me that we, in fact, need to do something to challenge those inequalities. And this is where I would want to critique Plato. Because Plato doesn't have an interest. He doesn't see it as a central part of, of morality 
to challenge inequality. He recognizes inequality, but he doesn't think that it's immorality to challenge inequality. Now, as we go, we're going to run into uh, Stoicism and Christianity, which will introduce the value of equality into our, our lexicon, our moral lexicon. Now, it'll take a while for that to, to kind of bubble up to the surface and become one of the driving values of modern thinking. And even then, it'll be under challenge as it becomes thought that everyone just is equal and it doesn't need to be pushed that people need to be kind of made equal in some sense. But with Plato, it's just not there yet. And, as we'll see, with Aristotle as well, there are going to be problems with equality. In any case, I'm going to leave you with those. I encourage you to come up with your own critiques. What do you think Plato got wrong? But as you come up with those critiques, don't move too fast, because Plato is not a stupid guy. So don't think that you get to come up with an argument that will immediately defeat Plato uh, from the beginning. Um, there's a, a famous claim when William James was a student, he wrote a paper trying to attack Plato. And his teacher at the time, uh, a man named Emerson, told him, if you're going to attack the king, make sure you kill him. So if you're going to attack Plato, make sure you've got a really good argument to do it with. Okay, on that note, we're finished with Plato, and we'll move on to Aristotle in the next lecture. I'll see you then.